Benjamin Ferenz, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's really extraordinary to be able to talk to you because of your vast experience that's so relevant now, as always. I just wonder, because I've heard that you can do it, recite from memory your opening statement from your prosecuting case back in September of 1947 at Nuremberg. Well, that's quite a challenge, but I, if I recall it, may it please your honors, it is with sorrow and with hope that we here disclose the deliberate murder of over a million innocent and defenseless people. Vengeance, Vengeance is, is not, not our, our goal. goal. Nor do we seek merely a just retribution. We ask this court to affirm by international penal action man's right to live in peace and dignity regardless of his race or creed. The case we present is a plea of humanity to law. Oh, that, that, is, that is extraordinary to hear that now. And I asked you because you've had a remarkable, remarkable career, even before you, you were prosecutor. You were in World War II. You landed in Normandy. It was around the Battle of the Bulge. But afterwards, you were assigned to go to the death camps, to Buchenwald, to Dachau, to, to try to collect the evidence. What must that have been like? What did you see when you went there? It was horror in capitals. It was incredible. My assignment was to get the evidence of the crimes. There was no difficulty. The evidence was lying dead in every camp I went into. Uh, their eyes, some of them were still pleading for help. Some were digging in the garbage, hoping to find a piece of bread. Uh, that was the scene that I saw, and it was similar in every camp to which I went. I proceeded then, of course, to the Schreibschule, the office, to seize whatever documentation was still there. Fortunately for me and unfortunately for them, uh, the special extermination squads were called Einsatzgruppen, action groups, recorded each town they were in, who was the commanding officer, and how many Jews and others that they slaughtered and I captured those documents. With that, it was very easy for me to proceed to trial. Uh, I had not been originally assigned as a trial lawyer. I had come out of the Harvard Law School with honors, uh, specializing with, uh, I was a researcher for a professor of international criminal law, and I was eager to use the material I had, and they, so they assigned me the job as chief prosecutor. I presented my case in two days, arrested my case, and convicted all of the 24 selected high-ranking Nazi officials. Thirteen of them were sentenced to death. It was a historic trial, and the convictions and the prosecution were his, made history. Mr. Ferenc, when you see what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, you know, we also have, have found ourselves scenes of bodies summarily executed, just the worst horrors as the Russian forces retreat from around Kyiv. What do you think all these years later, given what you hoped would be the case in holding that kind of crime accountable back in the Holocaust? I am heartbroken. I have spent the rest of my life after the Holocaust trying to create a world uh, of peace and harmony for everyone, regardless of their race or creed. And we've been making some progress in that direction by creating new international criminal courts, by teaching humanitarian law in universities. But to see it happening again, very similar, kids being shot, homes being blown up, it, it pains me to see that we have learned so little from the Holocaust and from the trials. Uh, and uh, I hope that we will come to our senses soon. I am urging uh, a ceasefire immediately to all the troops engaged in, in these combats and use that ceasefire time to promise them 
a conference of all the leading participants in the next couple of weeks to find a peaceable solution, as was anticipated when the United Nations Charter was drawn up. And the most important quote that I have for you is the quote of my commanding general during the war, commander of all of the Allied forces, later General, general John Dwight D. Eisenhower, later President of the United States, as President, he was leaving. He said, in a very real sense, we can no longer rely on force. If civilization is to survive, it must turn to the rule of law. Those have been my guiding lights. Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the wisdom that he passed on to the rest of the world, and which unfortunately is being disregarded today. Disregarded terribly by Russia, which was in part an ally during World War II and actually helped liberate some of those camps. It is extraordinary to see uh, what they are perpetrating today in Ukraine. So, Mr. Ferenz, do you think somebody like Vladimir Putin and his commanding generals can be held accountable. Already, our world leaders are accusing him of war crimes. We journalists and others have discovered the evidence. And today we have the video. All those years ago, you had the documents. Do you believe that he can be held accountable? Certainly, he can be held accountable. Uh, you cannot justify, by any argument, the murder of young children, taking them out of hospitals, killing their parents. That's what's happening repeatedly. And uh, we have crimes against humanity have been punishable, not only in Nuremberg, but later in many jurisdictions. And these are crimes against humanity. You have aggression. The invasion of Ukraine would probably classify as a clear case of aggression. And murder has always been a crime against humanity. So there is no difficulty in classifying the nature or the uh, existence of the crimes under which whoever is responsible for it can be held to account. And uh, Mr. Putin, uh, if he be the man who had been behind all this, uh, would certainly have a tough time walking out of the courtroom. So how do you envision that and in what kind of courtroom? Because you were, you know, instrumental in helping to set up the International Criminal Court, but neither Russia nor Ukraine and nor the United States of America are signatories and participants. How do you envision in what forum prosecuting the crimes of this war? We have set the model by the existing courts. Unfortunately, not every nation uh, is willing to accept an obligation not to murder the people they think are their enemies. Uh, so we have enough models and enough different courts. We had a court for crimes committed in Yugoslavia, crimes committed in, in other places. So there is no shortage of models where to put them. The difficulty is to get them to accept the jurisdiction of the court. The criminals will never want to have a court, but it's up to the public to either put them in jail or put them on trial or throw them out of office. They cannot continue this way to have people of importance in the administration of office telling their troops to go out and kill people they don't even know for crimes they can't even describe. And they kill them by the hundreds and the thousands. That's the world in which we live. And it's the world which I'm still trying to change at 103 years of age. And uh, I'm not discouraged. I say never give up, never give up, never give up.